LEGO Dimensions is a video game that, honestly, I don't think will ever be re-released again as far as I'm concerned. Now of course, I'd like to be wrong about that, and it's not like I want to be a pessimist, but considering the sheer volume of licensing deals that I'm sure must have been made in order to even make this game a reality in the first place, it just doesn't seem like the most feasible thing in the world to do. Regardless, LEGO Dimensions is a game that did happen at one point in time, and as the production of this video series has continued forward, I've begun to view this hefty project of mine as more than just an opportunity to take a fun look at a game that fascinates me. No, in fact, I want Dissecting Dimensions to become an archive, a time capsule, a video record of a game that may otherwise fall into obscurity and become really difficult to obtain as time continues to carry on. LEGO Dimensions, setting aside my distaste for the Toys to Life gimmick that came along with it, is easily one of the most unique video games I have ever experienced in my life. And I'm not even exaggerating. I think its strengths and weaknesses deserve to be acknowledged. Given the Toys to Life aspect, I'm certain that the overwhelming majority of players who own this game at one point or another have never experienced the full package, and even then, it's one thing to own the entire game, it's another to complete it. Over 1,000 gold bricks in total are needed for 100% completion? Oh lord, what did I get myself into? Now that we are living in current year, the fact of the matter is that the ability to 100% LEGO Dimensions has become more difficult and potentially even expensive than it originally was at retail price, especially since the support for LEGO Dimensions was completely ceased following the release of Wave 9 in 2017. Unless, of course, you have access to a phone or other electronic device that is capable of writing data to NFC stickers and are wise enough to figure out how to obtain the LEGO Dimensions toy tag app to write character and vehicle data to said stickers. I, of course, did manage to figure out how to do this for this video series and will be using them for vehicles and gadgets accordingly. However, I still went out of my way to acquire every single character's toy tag for the purposes of showing them off over the course of the series. Yes, every single one of them, even Green Arrow, Gamer Kid, Raven, Sonic, Finn, and Supergirl. That is how dedicated I am to this project. This tiny piece of plastic cost way more than it should have. I did not bother to purchase every single minifigure alongside the tags, however, seeing as that would have forced me to spend several hundred dollars more for all of them. And based on the community poll I did on my channel a while back, it seems the overwhelming majority of my audience at the time said that they would prefer I save my money rather than showing off the minifigures because it was completely unnecessary to them. Which is fair, given that this isn't a LEGO specific channel or anything. Yet. As such, consider this video part one of my Dissecting Dimensions video series, following the initial prologue video I've already done giving some brief introductory information on the background, functionality, and content waves released for the game. In this video, I will be discussing the baseline starter pack that is absolutely required in order to be able to even experience this game. This will be a fully comprehensive guide and discussion in regards to the actual contents contained within the physical starter pack, like the the three starting characters, the primary story mode of the game, and the toy pad mechanics. If you are looking for the content that is accessed through a specific character pack or adventure world, please refer to the corresponding video when applicable as those will be a more in-depth look at that specific content. This includes the three starting adventure worlds that are unlocked by the story mode characters. With that said, let's go ahead and get started with an in-depth look at the physical starter kit and all of the contents that come inside the box. Alrighty, so getting into the LEGO Dimensions Starter Kit. Um, as I mentioned in my initial introduction video, I ended up getting the Wii U Starter Kit for uh, this game because it was substantially cheaper than the PS4 Starter Kit. And then I just bought the used PS4 disc at GameStop for like five bucks. So this is the Wii U Starter Kit, but it's the same for all Starter Kits, everything that comes along. Um, with this one is included in all of them. There were some special edition starter kits released, one of which included Supergirl, which was for exclusive to the PS4. I know there were a couple other regional exclusive starter kits, maybe in other countries and things like that, but for the purposes of this video, I'm just going to be going over the base starter kit for all of this. So without further delay, let's just get right into this. Oh, and before I get into that, this is what the back of the box looks like in case anybody was interested in that. Okay, so going over what is included in the initial starter kit. Uh, the starter kit comes with a variety of things. Now, because I ended up making a video on LEGO Dimensions a long time ago, 
Um, I already went ahead and built the actual toy pad, so I can't unfortunately show off the pieces in the box or do some kind of like time lapse me building the portal base, that type of thing. So I do apologize there, I already have it completely built, but that's besides the point. So the starter kit comes with a few different things in it, first of which being this Lego Dimensions box, which contains all of the pieces um, for the toy pad portal as well as the main characters being Batman, Gandalf, and Wild Style. Um, this is the back of the box in case anyone was curious, showing off all of the level packs, team packs, and fun packs that were planned for the first year of content of LEGO Dimensions Waves 1 through 5, which I'll be going over in future videos. Um, alongside that, there were also and I apologize for my audio quality, I'm going off of my phones because it was just too complicated to hook up my microphone and sync this and all that, so apologies there, but I'm sure you'll be fine with it. So alongside the uh, actual pieces and the toy pad, which I'll be showing off in a second, um, it also came with this instruction booklet, which just basically shows you how to build, well, how to use the toy pad, place the character on the thing, you know, yada, 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 and then this is the instruction booklet telling you how to build each character. These are also digitally included in the game, LEGO Dimensions itself, so you are able to access this on your TV screen. If you were doing it that way, if you ended up losing this booklet or you bought a toy pad secondhand and didn't have one of these, you know, no big deal. You can still build it, and it's very good that they included that. And then, of course, last but not least, uh, they also included something really cool, if I can get this unfolded. I don't even know if I'm going to fit this entire thing on the camera frame, but... It also came with, if I can get this unfolded, this poster. Yeah, that whole thing might not fit on frame, but you know, you get the gist. This poster showing off all of the different properties that are represented in year one specifically. Um, that's actually the Spanish side, apologies. This is the English side of the poster. It just shows like DC Comics, Lego Movie, Lord of the Rings, Wizard of Oz, you know, all this stuff that I'm going to be going over in future videos. So, cool poster may or may not hang it up somewhere, I have no idea, but you know, cool nonetheless. Alright, so here is the toy pad which is also included in the starter kit. Of course you do have to build this base portal uh, by yourself after the fact, but like I said I had already pre-built this for a previous video I made, so it's already done. Um, but basically in order to play the game you need to be able to use this toy pad to place the characters on the three different sections of this toy pad so that you can interact with the game, pick the characters you want to play as, and perform various puzzles. Um, this portal is also shown off in the actual game itself, so it's a really cool kind of way to tie the real world to the video game world by showing um, you placing the character on the portal, they go in the portal in the game, you know, yada yada yada. Here's kind of an aerial angle to see what the portal looks like in more detail. These are the five keystones, which are the first collectible in the game you end up... Uh, I will end up going over this in the story mode section of the video, which has already actually been recorded before I'm doing this. So, yeah, those are... Actually, the game has you put them on the back here to start on these weird handle things, and then you, as you collect them in the game, you add them onto the section of the toy pad. So that's actually kind of cool, um, but regardless, that's what the toy pad looks like. And then alongside that, oh, I, I should also mention, here's Expo. This is like a Lego model of Expo, so for what that's worth. Um, cool. Uh, and then alongside that comes the three starting characters and the starting vehicle, which are required for playing the base story mode in the game because the game literally will not let you go into the first level without placing all three of these characters on the toy pad. So first up we have Batman himself right here. Yeah, there he is in all his uh, Gotham glory. Batman comes with the Batarang accessory. Um, and yeah, I mean, he's pretty straightforward. He's Batman, so if the camera will focus, there you go. There's like an up-close shot of the minifigure. Um, I don't have minifigures for all of these characters, unfortunately, uh, but I will be showing off every single toy tag at the very least, so for what that's worth. Um, next up, we have Gandalf the Grey. Gandalf is right here. Uh, there he is. His accessory obviously being his staff because, you know, Gandalf wouldn't be... The same without it, so there's Gandalf, you know, pretty cool, Lord of the Rings rep, awesome. So, Wild Style, right here, there she is, uh, comes with her detector relic uh, device, that's her accessory, obviously coming from the Lego movie, which was only a year old when this game actually came out, she's also got a really cool like graffiti styled toy tag, um, 
yeah, she's the third playable character. And then last but not least is the Batmobile, which is the starting vehicle that comes with the game. This vehicle is required for 100% because it is mandatory for story mode. And so that is what comes in the starter kit of LEGO Dimensions. And that's about all I have to say for that section of the video. So I will go ahead and take you back to post-recorded Shadow Streak for the next section. And now, I would like to introduce a section of this video that I'm very excited for, the character bios. Over the course of this series, I will be providing you with an overall description of every playable character contained within the game, their abilities, what they unlock, and so on and so forth. Anything pertaining to them that is required for 100% completion, whether it be a unique ability or vehicle gadget, will be acknowledged so that anybody using this series as a guide can make note of what they will need in order to experience all of the game's content. After all, there is some overlap between the character's abilities and worlds. You do not need to purchase everything in order to 100% the game, just a greater part of it. Now, of course, there are multiple possible combinations of characters one could purchase to complete the game, so my recommendation recommended characters are only one of the many possibilities. I did my best to narrow down the required characters list to be as cheap as possible. With that said, however, let's go ahead and get into the first character out of 75. Alright, here he is, the Dark Knight himself. Batman, aka Bruce Wayne, is an extremely wealthy businessman by day and a masked vigilante protecting the streets of Gotham City by night. His origin basically started when his parents were killed in a back alley as a young boy, and since then he grew into the martial arts master detective that he is in the present day. Initially created in 1939 by Bill Finger and Bob Kane, Batman's first appearance was made in Detective Comics issue number 27 and rapidly rose to popularity as he earned his very first solo title just one year later in 1940. Since then, Batman has become one of, if not the biggest name DC Comics owns over the decades and has been the focal point of dozens of comic runs, video games, TV shows, merchandise, films, action figures, Legos, and so much more. He's even the face of an entire trilogy of LEGO video games, not including his role in LEGO Dimensions as one of the starring characters. The cherry on top of all of this is that he's even in the center of the Dimensions cover art and is most likely the first thing your eyes are going to be drawn to when you look at the box. Needless to say, Bruce Wayne lives up to his billionaire status. Despite all of this, within LEGO Dimensions itself, Batman is surprisingly limited in terms of his character's abilities, far more than any of the other LEGO video games he's appeared in. He can grapple to pull various objects and structures down or towards him, he can use his batarangs to activate switches and as combat projectiles, and he can go into stealth in context-sensitive areas. And that's about it. Considering his usual association with high-tech gadgets and technology, I'll admit I was expecting a bit more than just these three standard abilities. Would have been nice if he had access to gliding with his cape like in the Arkham games, or even multiple different suits like in LEGO Batman. He does, at the very least, have access to the Batmobile as his primary vehicle, which has two additional upgrades in the form of the Bat Blaster and the Sonic Bat Ray. All character-associated vehicles and gadgets in this game come with two upgradable forms, might I mention, so this will continue to be a trend with every character bio we discuss. Well, almost everyone. Between these three modes, the vehicles are able to drop mines, create an electric shield, and fire projectiles. Batman also automatically provides the player with access to the DC Comics Adventure World, and given that he is a mandatory story mode character, is logically required in order to 100% the game. Overall, he's a relatively fun character to play as, albeit a bit basic. I enjoy being him the most in story mode because he's pretty cleverly written, voiced by the well-experienced Troy Baker, and, well, because he's Batman. I mean, come on, who doesn't like Batman? Next up, we have Gandalf the Grey, an incredibly powerful wizard who guided Frodo during the first portion of his journey through Middle-earth to Mordor, helped turn the tide of the Battle of Helm's Deep, and looked good while doing so. This wouldn't be a crossover game without some exciting franchises meshing together with each other, and Lord of the Rings was a great choice if I do say so myself. 
Gandalf the Grey first appeared in J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit when it was first published in 1937. Of course, the most well-known version of the character in popular culture is most likely that of Ian McKellen's performance in Peter Jackson's film adaptations of The Fellowship of the Ring, The Two Towers, and Return of the King, which released in the very early 2000s. Gandalf in this game is recognizably voiced by Tom Kane, and he does a pretty good job in doing so. Gandalf has previously appeared in the LEGO video games for both Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, so this isn't his first rodeo in a LEGO game either. His abilities mostly consist of being being able to use magic to manipulate or build objects, and he is also capable of lighting up dark areas with his staff in context-sensitive areas. He can also use projectile-based attacks at a range which hone in on enemies, a very useful ability that the other two main characters of story mode are incapable of, and finally he can create a magic shield which protects him from several varieties of attacks at the cost of his own movement and mobility. Gandalf is obviously required to 100% the game seeing as he is one of the three required story mode characters. He also unlocks the Middle-Earth adventure world upon being placed into the game. Gandalf does not, however, come with any vehicles or gadgets. And here we have the final member of the story mode trifecta, Wildstyle. Unlike her other two counterparts who come from the first half of the 20th century, Wildstyle is very much a 21st century representative and one of the best master builders in the game. She made her very first, and at the time of the game's initial release, only appearance in popular culture as one of the main cast members of 2014's The Lego Movie, directed by Phil Lord and Chris Miller. And technically, The Lego Movie video game as well. Wildstyle is a very no-nonsense kind of character who's agile and strong. Plus, she was dating her universe's version of Batman at one point. In LEGO Dimensions, Elizabeth Banks reprises her role as the character from the film. Wildstyle is very much a physical fighter, mostly relying on punches and kicks to take down enemies in close combat. She does not have the range advantages that Batman and Gandalf do, however she makes up for this with her acrobatics capabilities. She comes equipped with the ability to double jump, wall jump, swing around beams, and pull down specially marked levers that are too high to reach for most other characters. She also also has the Relic Detection and Master Builder abilities, which allow her to find hidden items located around the map and build specially marked objects and items that most regular characters cannot. This is done simply by placing Wildstyle on all three sections of the toy pad in the corresponding order, which adds an extra level of interactivity to these moments in the game. As with Batman and Gandalf, she is required to 100% the game because she is a member of the starter pack and story mode would be impossible to complete without her. Personally, I find Wildstyle to be my least favorite of the three story mode characters that are playable given that the building ability is just a more restrictive version of the regular building ability that every character can do, but story-wise she was pretty consequential to the plot, so I can give her that much. Plus, that double jump ability makes platforming much easier in certain circumstances. So with a singular game as gargantuan as LEGO Dimensions, what is the story actually about? Well, as far as the game is concerned, the primary story mode consists of 15 levels, each of which takes place in a different dimension containing one of the various IPs that are featured within the Year 1 content of the game. Unfortunately, none of the Year 2 content has any attachment to story mode, so don't expect anyone like Sonic the Hedgehog or the Teen Titans to show up here. The main campaign technically begins with the opening cutscene that plays when you initially boot up the game before even getting to the title screen. Within this cutscene, we are introduced to the primary antagonist of the game known as Lord Vortek, an evil interdimensional being in search of the 12 Foundation Elements, artifacts from the various dimensions each containing a cosmic power that, when combined, bring forth the foundation of all dimensions, a relic so powerful it can give its wielder the ability to manipulate and create dimensions as they see fit. Lord Lord Vortek here wants this power for himself so that he may create one universal dimension in which every resident bows down before him as the true ruler of the multiverse. Upon arriving to the center of said multiverse, he comes across a mysterious planet named Foundation Prime, a planet said to house the foundation of all dimensions that can give him the ultimate power. He travels to this planet with his robot companion Expo, although he quickly betrays him and banishes him through a rift after Expo voices doubt. Just so you know, the foundation elements are the cornerstones of time and space, so they're kind of important to the entire universe. Your services are no longer required. 
But the elements can't be safely harnessed. It's too dangerous. And what about the pay raise you promised me? <laughs> it's a rather sudden betrayal, but the game doesn't tell us what kind of relationship these two characters really had before then, and I guess we gotta stress how evil Gary Oldman is anyways. Oh, did I forget to mention that? Yeah, LEGO Dimensions has one of the biggest all-star casts I've ever seen in any video game. Period. Gary Oldman as the main villain is only scratching the surface of every single person that is featured in this game, but we'll get there in time. With Expo gone, Vortek begins using his powers to gather villains across the various dimensions that are willing to assist him in his rise to power. Unfortunately, due to his current state, his body is incapable of traveling in between dimensions very often as it has slowly drained him, so he needs others to serve him in doing so, such as the Joker and Saruman, who agree to join him in this endeavor. Of course, this sets off the chain of events that brings our main three heroes together. Cut to Gotham City, where Batman and Robin are currently in pursuit of Bane in a wild goose chase across the city when suddenly a blue rift opens up and whisks Robin away to some unknown dimension. Batman, not knowing the phenomenon that is occurring before him, jumps in after Robin and winds up traveling to Middle Earth where he encounters Gandalf the Grey amidst his fight with the Balrog as they plummet down to the depths below. Together, the two of them save themselves and recover at the top of the perch only for Frodo Baggins to get whisked away into another portal similar to how Robin did just moments ago. With the one ring, might I add. Like poetry, Batman and Gandalf jump in the portal after him and somehow end up traveling to Cloud Cuckoo Land where they end encounter the Lego Movie crew amidst one of their party sessions with an admittedly great moment of Batman meeting his alternate universe self. Batman? Gandalf? Batman? Ow! You landed on my back, man. I'm Batman. No, I didn't say- Hey, I'm Batman. I'm Batman. I'm Batman. I'm Batman. I'm Batman. Oh, twins! Of course, the festivities don't last for long because, as luck would have it, Metalbeard soon finds himself getting whisked away in yet another rift, and Wildstyle joins the Bat and Wizard on their quest while Emmett and Unikitty get left behind. Pretty soon, the three of them find themselves transported to a mysterious cavern known as Vorton, where the generator then implodes upon itself. With no idea of where to go, this is where the game takes a brief pause to introduce the players to the tutorial of the game by having each of the three characters contribute to building the rift portal using their various character abilities. Wildstyle uses her acrobatics to jump while Gandalf uses his magic. It's pretty self-explanatory. After each of the characters has built their portion of the portal, the game takes a moment to prompt the player to actually build the real one for their toy pad, which I've already done, but it's admittedly a cool way to bridge the gap between the game world and the real one, as simple as it is. In doing so, the game carries on, the portal activates itself, whisking away Batman, Gandalf, and Wildstyle to the Land of Oz, where the story really begins. The actual plot can basically be broken down into three different arcs. The Keystone Arc, the Elements Arc, and the Vortec Arc. These are unofficial names that I coined myself based upon my own experience, however, the game doesn't outright label these as such, but it's the easiest way I can break down this game's plot for the purposes of this discussion. The Keystone Arc begins after Batman and friends witness this mysterious purple keystone get sucked into the portal that they jump in after, bringing them to the Land of Oz where the Wicked Witch of the West proceeds to steal it for herself, provoking the three of them to give chase after her and ultimately defeat her to get the keystone back. The next few levels then feature a similar process as the trio travels to the Simpsons, Ninjago, Doctor Who, and DC Comics worlds in order to obtain all of the keystones that give them the various abilities used throughout the game. After getting all five keystones, the characters encounter Vortek himself in Hill Valley and have a bus battle with him before he gets away. Returning to Vorton where they are able to rebuild his former buddy Expo, who then informs them of Vortek's evil plan and suggests that they gather the remaining foundation elements that he is seeking before he does. This opens up the second arc of the game where the trio travel to Aperture Science, Middle Earth, the Phantom Zone, Midway Arcade, and a mysterious Scooby-Doo mansion to gather as many elements as possible while Vortek continues to plot his attack on the heroes. After acquiring the final Foundation element, Batman, Gandalf, and Wildstyle travel to Foundation Prime in order to take Vortek down once and for all. But unfortunately, he gets the better of them and manages to collect the 12 Foundation elements and create THE Foundation of all dimensions, giving him immense power which in turn allows him to convert Robin, Frodo, and Metalbeard into an entity 
Nazi known as the Tri, which Batman, Gandalf, and Wildstyle then proceed to take down in the following level and rescue their friends after all this time. Personally, I think the Tri as a concept is kinda dumb considering it doesn't really correlate to the rest of the game's aesthetic. It's a little silly. <laughs> truth be told. Plus, the name is also really lame. However, there is still work to be done, and thus the three of them travel back to the various worlds that they had already visited through the adventure and recruit characters like the Doctor, the Scooby Gang, the Ghostbusters, the Spaceship Defender, all of them, who proceed to help them take down Vortech in the final climactic battle. But of course, GLaDOS absolutely steals the show with her cutscene. <laughs> I guess we'll be seeing a nicer side of her from now on. And that is because you are a fool. A fool with stupid hair. What? Hey! I am so glad they got Ellen McClain to reprise her role here. GLaDOS is such an incredible character. Together, they all team up and take on Vortech, and after a hard-fought battle, they manage to destroy the foundation of all dimensions, eliminate his power over the multiverse, and banish him inside a cross-rift between dimensions forever, thus bringing the game to a close. And that's the plot of LEGO Dimensions in a nutshell. Apologies for skipping over most of the individual level subplots and featured franchises here. I'd considered dedicating time to each level in this video and getting into the nitty-gritty plot of each, but I decided that doing so would cause the video to feel disjointed, cluttered, bloated, there'd be too much going on. I'll be covering each franchise in their own separate videos and we'll be acknowledging more specific traits and references there, so if anything occurs during story mode that I believe to be really worth mentioning, I will acknowledge it in those respective videos instead. For now, the last thing I'll mention is that the credits for this game are absolutely genius. <laughs> I can really tell that the team at Traveler's Tales consists of big time Portal fans because they managed to write a brand new song for GLaDOS to sing during the ending credit sequence, just like in the original two Portal games. This was news to me. I've been a diehard Portal fan since like 2010, and I'm only just now discovering the song's existence. Like, wow. I knew Portal was featured in the game, but I never knew they got Ellen McClain to do a third GLaDOS song. That's huge. Following the credits, we get a scene depicting a character with a red arm stumbling upon a piece of Lord Vortech, picking it up, and transforming into some variation of him. But unfortunately, this cliffhanger was never followed up on, so there's no official confirmation as to who this character is, or what the plans were to go from here. Maybe this was implying something in the Year 3 content that never ended up happening. Maybe it was a hint to a direct sequel. No idea. But yes, overall, I really enjoyed the plot of the game. It was a little monotonous at points in the middle of the first two arcs where it just felt like I was playing levels without much plot going on, but for the most part, I found the pacing to be pretty alright. Lord Vortech is a pretty enjoyable villain, and I liked Expo a lot, so yeah, it was a good time. I felt like some of the levels might have gone on a little too long, but for the most part, each one introduced an interesting setup and had a cool boss fight to go along with it, so yeah, honestly, story mode is fun when you're not trying to get all of the 100% collectibles. So I guess that's a good segue into discussing how the game actually plays. Well, for starters, it's your basic Traveler's Tales LEGO game formula that anybody should easily be able to jump into. You go through each stage collecting studs, which act as currency used to buy upgrades and abilities. There are mini kits to get into each stage like always, which contribute to these cool statues in this particular game. There is a rule breaker status, which is achieved by earning a specific amount of studs in each level, and a citizen in peril to collect who usually consists of a specific character to that franchise in an optional side area. At the end of each level, there's usually a boss fight, and upon defeating them, you win the level and progress on to the next one. If you've played a LEGO game before, you'll have no trouble swinging into this one, so rather than go over the redundancy of basic LEGO gameplay, I'll instead provide focus on the more specific elements of this game in particular and why it stands out so much when compared to other games. For starters, the way you experience the story mode wholeheartedly depends on what characters you have available to you. If you have a plethora of ones to choose from, then you'll have no problem getting to experience the side puzzles, citizens in peril, and other bonus content. Plus, you can use any character you want for as long as you want, acting as the free play mode of any other LEGO game. 
However, and maybe I'm wrong for making this assumption, but hey, most kids probably didn't own all of the characters the first time they played through the game, so they were stuck playing as Batman, Gandalf, and Wildstyle, and maybe a couple of other characters for the entire duration of the story mode. Theoretically, a person should be able to play through the entire base game with just the starter pack, as advertised, which means all 14 levels had to be designed with the assumption that only three characters in one vehicle could be used to experience the entire story. This creates huge limitations on the diversity of character-based puzzles that are required to be solved in the game because it feels like you're activating the same Batarang panel, lighting up the same dark room, and master building over and over again with little change. It certainly doesn't help that all three of these characters were nerfed compared to what they're capable of in their own specific LEGO games because the developers needed to spread character abilities across a much larger cast of characters locked behind content packs so that people would purchase them in order to make more money. Not that that was the developer's fault, that was totally the executives mandating that, but still, it's a flaw. And playing through story mode with the same three characters the entire way through gets a little monotonous after a while, I won't lie. One of the best things that I enjoy about games like LEGO Star Wars and LEGO Marvel Super Heroes is the sheer diversity of characters and abilities at your fingertips. Nearly every level has you playing a different combination of characters in story mode and that leads to the constant feeling of fresh experiences. This time you're stuck with the same three movesets for the entire game, which further illustrates my issue with the concept of Toys to Life games as a whole. Your enjoyment of them is solely based on how much money you dump into it. At the same same time though, I kinda understand why the game was as expensive as it is given its sheer scope and licensing requirements that I'm sure were costly to obtain. Not to mention the fact that LEGO products are sold at higher prices because they are not cheap products to manufacture. I don't know if I still feel like the game shouldn't have been as roadblocky as it was regardless because the higher a hero mechanic returns once again for players to use if they want to obtain any blocked objectives without purchasing the character packs, but that gets expensive super quick and you only get to use them for two minutes at a time, which is stupid. You should be able to purchase them once and then use them until you leave the room that you're currently in. On the opposite side of the spectrum, however, having access to any character you want in the story mode from the get-go absolutely breaks a lot of the levels because you can just pick a flying character like Superman or a Powerpuff Girl and then just fly past everything to get to the end of the stage as quickly as possible. None of the levels were designed for you to use a flying character throughout them, so when you encounter areas like this where you can just fly past everything on screen, it completely destroys any and all challenge. As far as accuracy goes, I think nearly every level does a fantastic job of representing its corresponding property, although certain levels feel like they had more put into them than others at points. For instance, the Doctor Who level really seems keen on making a bunch of references that I understand absolutely none of, but the DC Comics level doesn't really feel all that special coming from somebody more familiar with that franchise. I suppose this is justified with DC characters appearing in most of the other levels as bosses or the occasional helper character. I'm looking at you, Superman. Either way, I still knew I was in Metropolis and recognized the references that were there, but the most defining thing about that stage is that Sauron from Middle Earth is there. And there's a whole fight against him in this admittedly epic looking boss battle, but that feels more at home in Lord of the Rings than DC Comics, you know? Most of the Back to the Future stage gets overshadowed by the fight with Lord Vortak, whereas with Portal, there's all these different testing chambers structured just like the game of Origin, and even a sequence where Wheatley helps you try to escape. And there's even a super cool fight with GLaDOS herself at the end, just like in the original Portal game. Also, why base the Hill Valley level on the worst of the three movies? And what I find really strange is that both Jurassic World and Legends of Chima, despite being part of the year one releases, do not get their own story mode stage in the game. They are the only two to do so at that, although I guess I can understand why Jurassic World wouldn't have gotten one because technically LEGO Jurassic World was the game that Traveler's Tales had released right before this one, so maybe they saw it as kind of redundant. I don't know. Truth be told, the boss fights are probably the best parts of the whole game considering most of them are treated more like puzzles rather than outright beat-em-ups. It's all about using the resources available to put the opponent into a weakened state before making a strike at them, whether that's the Riddler-Balrog battle or the fight with General Zod. It's pretty fun trying to figure out how to take down the Lord Business using the keystones and portals to navigate around the Springfield power plant. Do you mind? This is a new suit! Oh yeah, I suppose now is a good time to talk about the other signature gameplay mechanic of this game, the toy pad and keystones. 
For the purposes of this brief segment, I will be using the portal level Glad to See You to demonstrate these five abilities, seeing as I figure it is the most fitting environment to use. Plus, the first keystone shares the same sound effect as the actual portal effect from the portal series. I will also be using live action footage alongside this, so I apologize if the lighting looks bad or indistinguishable at points, but unfortunately because the toy pad lights up several different colors, it can cause my camera to have trouble capturing it all in the best quality. During story mode, the player collects these five keystones, which enables them to activate special abilities using the toy pad in front of them. Integrating the base into the game more beyond just placing a character on it to spawn them in or avoid getting locked in boss attacks. There are actually five different puzzle solving abilities that get utilized throughout the game. The first of which being Shift. The Shift Keystone spawns three portals around the active environment in the colors of CMY, or Cyan, Magenta, and Yellow. Each section of the toy pad correspondingly lights itself up to match one of these colors, and when you place a particular character on a specific color, they are automatically warped to that portal within the game itself. This ability is extremely common in boss battles where you need to warp between sections to build objects or attack certain weak points on a particular boss character. Second comes the Chroma Keystone, which requires three of these color pads to be active in the level in order to activate. The toy pad remains a blank white canvas until the player runs through a particular color, yielding a sudden change in the section of the toy pad they're standing on to the color that they just became. From here, the player must light up the toy pad to match the pattern that is presently shown somewhere on screen inside the game in order to progress, and in later levels especially, it becomes required to mix different colors together by having multiple characters stand on the same section of the toy pad. The third keystone is named Elemental, which grants the player 3 out of 4 possible elemental shields that they can use to resist damage of that type, and fire a beam of energy at opponents and objects from a far distance. Typically, the water and fire elements are always accessible, while the third element flip-flops between electricity and earth depending on the specific context. Fourth is the keystone Scale, which causes characters to grow or shrink in size depending on which side of the toy pad they are placed on. If a character is large, they move much more slowly but are incredibly strong, capable of picking up large objects. Small characters, on the other hand, are capable of climbing into small tubes which are usually used to activate switches. Although they are occasionally missing segments that a larger character either needs to stand underneath of or throw a section into place that is resting on the ground somewhere. And the fifth and final keystone is named Locate, which is probably my least favorite of them all. Basically, the way it works is that there is a hidden item or rift somewhere in the nearby vicinity and the toy pad glows greener the closer you get to it. The further away, the redder it gets. Sometimes I find this one a little annoying because it's a bit finicky on when you're actually at the perfect brightness to be close enough to activate the portal. The first time I ever had to use this ability, I ran around the stage for like three minutes avoiding these bosses' attacks just to figure out where the dang rift was hidden at. At the very least, you get a cool animation of something from a previous dimension you visited coming to assist you, but in terms of actual gameplay, it's the least interesting because you're running around as opposed to actually doing anything. Still, this is a unique way to introduce a new form of puzzles into a LEGO game and promote more interactivity between the toy pad and the game itself, so at the very least kudos to Traveler's Tales for figuring that out. It gets even better when later levels actually give you the option to pick between different keystone abilities because there are multi-step puzzles that require more than one to be used to complete them. Overall, I enjoy the keystones, they're a pretty nifty gimmick that brings something interesting and new to the table. And that just about sums up LEGO Dimensions Story Mode. All in all, I think it's a pleasant experience with tons of fun moments, entertaining boss fights, immersive levels that pay homage to the source material, it's fun. I still don't like the way the character selection was handled as I feel like playing with just the starter pack characters gets incredibly boring, but having access to all of the characters completely breaks a lot of it. Thankfully, every other LEGO game that I've played at the very least doesn't have this issue, so this seems to be a specific flaw of the design of Dimensions. Personally, I'm more excited to experience each individual adventure world than I was for the story mode anyways, so now the fun really begins. Be sure to tune in to the next episode of Dissecting Dimensions where we take a look at the first of 30 adventure worlds. Detective Comics, here we come. Why do these things always have to be so bright?